Great. So thank you so much all for uh, uh, joining us for the first session after lunch uh, on uh, um, uh, questions related to uh, supporting entrepreneurship and sustainability through <coughs> supply chain relationships. So, you know, we've heard a lot today about things going on within firms, but, uh, you know, a huge part of uh, uh, how uh, we think we can uh, uh, obtain impact is through working with very large uh, uh, typically uh, Western-based multinationals who have uh, huge supply relationships uh, uh, with countries in the emerging uh, 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 world uh, and uh, uh, using those relationships in order to bring about uh, uh, positive change, uh, poverty alleviation, <laughs> growth, et cetera. And so we'll be talking uh, uh, about that today. So we have uh, uh, three wonderful uh, panelists with us. Uh, uh, the first uh, uh, to my left uh, is uh, uh, Chris Major Argueta. Um, as uh, some of you uh, may be familiar with, uh, MIT has uh, probably the leading supply chain uh, 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 masters and initiative uh, in the world. And we're uh, very honored uh, that Chris is joining us. He's a research scientist at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, uh, as well uh, as the director of the MIT Supply Chain and Global Logistics Excellence Network for Latin America. And he'll be sharing uh, 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 some of uh, his 12 years of experience uh, working across many continents, uh, thinking about uh, improving the efficiency uh, of supply chains, uh, for, uh, uh, in, in this case, I think a bunch about small firms as well, uh, a topic which we're uh, 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 going to be talking more about this afternoon. Um, this, our second panelist is, is Jose Velasquez uh, Martinez, who's also uh, uh, at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, uh, and uh, he is the director of MIT Sustainable Supply Chain a Lab, uh, which is obviously particularly relevant for everything uh, we're talking uh, about today, and again, has particular expertise uh, in sustainability and small firms uh, in emerging markets. And then finally, we're uh, 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 very lucky to have Chris uh, Arsenault, who is uh, a senior uh, manager for responsible leadership at New Balance. Uh, Jay Powell has recently uh, 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 been uh, 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 talking with New Balance about uh, their, their uh, uh, very impressive responsible leadership uh, 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 programs, uh, and we are very excited to hear uh, 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 some of his insights from his long career with New Balance, where he uh, has been working a lot at building these supplier relationships uh, and uh, uh, leveraging those uh, in order to achieve some of the goals we've been talking about uh, today. So what we're going to do uh, is a little bit uh, uh, different uh, than some of the other panels. Uh, we have uh, uh, um, uh, some slides from uh, 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 some of the panelists, and so uh, we'll have some kind of short uh, kind of uh, uh, presentations there, and then we'll go back to kind of a more panel-like uh, format and uh, uh, particularly uh, 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 hear from Chris uh, 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 from that. And kind of just as kind of a broad overview to kind of the topics we'll be kind of discussing here uh, is, you know, there's a lot of uh, ways that uh, uh, kind of these supply relationships uh, uh, and global supply chains can uh, uh, be forces for uh, uh, poverty alleviation, for uh, 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 generating uh, uh, impact. Uh, and uh, we probably won't touch on them all today, but, you know, most obviously uh, is, uh, you know, in, in terms of a kind of a force for uh, uh, creating uh, a kind of uh, 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 good jobs in developing countries, uh, certainly as someone who's done a lot of uh, 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 research on topics related to trade and development, uh, uh, you know, we know uh, 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 few uh, stronger forces for generating growth uh, than uh, demand coming from uh, uh, kind of richer countries uh, uh, for workers in the developing world uh, 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 to, to produce. And obviously that lies at the heart uh, of Shahi exports, lies at the heart of New Balance, et cetera. And that's a kind of enormous force uh, for transformation in these developing countries. But of course, with that force for transformation, uh, 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 we, we also wish that those uh, uh, employment opportunities are, are good jobs. Uh, uh, and typically they are compared to where these uh, workers are coming from, but not as good uh, as the jobs that we aspire to uh, in the West. And, uh, you know, a lot of work that's been done recently is improving the quality of those jobs, and we'll hear a bunch about that. We've already heard a bunch about that uh, today. And increasingly, questions of sustainability uh, uh, with regards to the environment uh, 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 come up, with regards to, uh, uh, to human uh, 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 rights, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are also obviously uh, kind of key uh, 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 priorities in, in, in kind of bringing about uh, 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 social impact. And so we'll hear a, a bunch of thoughts uh, on these topics. Uh, and so maybe uh, first up, uh, uh, Chris, if you want to uh, sure. say a few words uh, with the benefit of some slides. Yep, perfect. Well. Thank you very much. I know that is the most difficult time after just the launch, but we will make our best, okay? So, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Chris Mejia. I don't know how many of you know how many of these type of entrepreneurships exist in the world. 
especially the ones that sell fruits, vegetables, and that are related to the retail. How many do you think? Yeah? Take the numbers, Oscar. How many do you think that exist around the world? Quickly. Make your bet. Millions. One million only? <laughs> well, to make it a like quick. So, uh, do you want to do you want to try? I don't know. I would say around 200 million. 200 what? 200 million. Okay. 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 It's in between. It's 50 million. Okay. We estimate that there are like around 50 million nano stores of this type. Okay. But uh, well, so today, uh, actually, my colleague Josue and I were going to be discussing a little bit about like the importance of this type of family-owned retailers and other other topics related to sustainability. But well, first, we wanted to tell you what is the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. We typically work in these three spheres that you see there. Uh, we and our motto is like uh, driving supply chain innovation into practice. So everything that we do has to be applied as well. We are trying to do that. And to do it, actually, we engage with companies. And that's actually the green sphere that you see there. We work in 13 different laboratories or research groups, as you can see in the, uh, in the sphere that is colored yellow, by the way. And we also have like, plenty of other educational programs that allow us you know, like, to touch lives and to make a difference also with the work that we are doing for companies. But well, let me come back to the important part. right? So I just wanted to level set a little bit uh, the knowledge on what, we're gonna be, what is going to be our focus, and it's in freight transportation, logistics, and supply chain management. Okay? So next one is, well, what I do in the food and retail operations lab together with my team. So to get us started, what, what we tend to do is like to focus on understanding any of the stores that I show you. For, and for that, we already published a book related to how to publish, uh, how to serve these 50 million nano stores that we consider that exist around the world. So it, this book contains 11 case studies related to how really make a difference for them, right? But considering that these nano stores, these small family owned stores are at the center, we also want to consider how to connect the food ecosystems. Smallholder farmers, and consumers and make sure that all of them don't suffer food malnutrition, that we, on the other hand, we are not wasting food. And for that, we are working with plenty of different circular economy approaches to make sure that this is not going to happen. At the same time, we want to create dignity of choice. The dignity of choice comes from the food safety. Mm -hmm. Okay, We want to make sure that all the cold chains are not going to be breaking, and then we can guarantee that all of them are going to receive high quality food. But as you know, vulnerable population segments, unfortunately, do not have this benefit most of the times. So we are trying to make a difference with that. And for that, we have the supply chains, right? We are trying to create intervention schemes from the supply chain perspective into transportation, into how to store certain things to make sure that the shopkeepers, smallholder farmers, collaborate with each other. And the last thing that I want to mention is actually the, the part that you see here. So all of you have mentioned that uh, uh, market access is a big issue in economics. It's also in logistics, let me tell you, especially for smallholder farmers. Most of them are selling their stuff like locally, and sometimes they have like, the opportunity to sell this like, internationally. How we can develop their skills, so that's something that we want to do. And our next frontier is actually to make sure that we create long-term long -term, uh, food ecosystems around the world. That's what you see at the center. And for that, well, I'm not going to mention all my colleagues here. We are working with people from different uh, countries around the world. You will see that in the next slide. But this is a multidisciplinary team. We work with nutritionists. We work with sociologists or social, scientists, so social scientists, data scientists, et cetera, in order to make sure that we are able to tackle the same problem with different lenses, as you do in JPAL, in GPL, right? And well, this is just a few of the partners that we are working with around the world, so we would love to find ways to collaborate with you guys. But the most important thing that I want to set here is like, it would be fantastic, you know, like to create synergies and add the logistics component around what we are tackling here. That is alleviating poverty, or in, in my case, also like to fight food malnutrition and reduce food waste, okay? So with that, well, that's it. Thank you guys. So next. <laughs> I think you're next. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Should I go now? Yes. OK, excellent. So as you probably can notice, Chris and I have like similar accent. So we come prepared. We both are Mexicans. And uh, we actually studied probably. together the PhD. 
And uh, at that time, Chris was copying me all the time, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now I'm copying him with all this nanostar work that he Don't started that. doing it. They're being recorded. <laughs> all right. It's just a joke, by the way, off the record, off the record. He just copied me a few homework, but not, ah, just kidding. <laughs> so one, one of the things that, uh, that, that Ian and, and Michael and David asked ask me to, uh, to prepare, it's uh, uh, something related to the, to the session's topic on sustainability and how this can be driven by leveraging supply chain and also helping entrepreneurship in emerging markets. Now, I've been working on sustainable supply chains for more than a decade, trying, uh, trying to, and I believe, effectively helping companies account specifically for environmental information in, the, in their logistics decisions. But what I, what I brought here is a few examples, right? So you will not see a, a fancy storyline, but what you will see some illustrations of uh, different interventions, success stories, and also some research focus that we've been doing and we currently are developing in our research efforts at the Center for Transportation and Logistics. So first, I wanted to show just a tiny video of uh, logistics operations. So you see a truck of Bimbo, Sigma, Alimentos, you're gonna see Coca-Cola, you're gonna see Barcel, you're gonna see like one of the largest uh, CPGs in the world, delivering just to a corner store that just Chris mentioned, what we call a nano store, because we don't say mom and pop, because the mom and pop here are actually probably three, four, five times bigger than this nano store. Right? Now, this nano store, by the way, as Chris said, is 50 million all over the world. They represent the vast majority of the retail market. It's the largest. Now, if you go to, to Latin America, these guys actually are bigger than uh, Walmart or a Carrefour, or any other, right? Like if you look at what Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Danone are selling, from 40 to 70% of all the sales goes to this market. Right? So this is actually mo much more important. Now, if you take a look at this, if you actually just see this operation, you can actually compare with the famous cross dock, fancy stuff that Walmart developed with P&G. This is not happening here. Right? So you don't, you don't have one single truck delivering all the goods. You have seven trucks in one corner store, which in turn implies the products are gonna be more expensive. Now, second, it's very likely that these guys are not really ordering a lot because they don't have money, right? They don't have the, the, fin the financial support. So they don't get economies of scale. So if they don't get economies of scale, that means they are actually paying more for the product. Now, once they get the product, they actually split the product in a smaller SKUs to sell to people that actually do not have credit cards and do not have any money, which we are talking about the bottom billion. And now when we work with that, then actually the poorest is actually paying the most expensive product in this channel which is really unfortunate. So some of the things that we are working is how we can actually help first large CPGs to find these collaborations that you were talking, David, like between different entities in the supply chain, so that we can actually deliver more effectively, which in turn will also gonna reduce the costs that they pay. This is at least our intuition. We are running some interventions to really test this hypothesis, but we've seen some evidence that demonstrate that this is actually the case. And therefore, getting more cash availability to also their, their, their nano stores. Now, uh, this is, for instance, one of the uh, projects that I like is some of the examples. This probably doesn't sound so uh, exciting uh, when you compare it with the developed world in which you already have dedicated areas for loading and unloading. Mm -hmm. But as you saw, when you are in, in, in developing countries, you got double parking. And let's be honest, you also have double parking here in Boston, by the way. <laughs> right, but they do double, they go the other side, they put in the other corner, and all those things, when you just uh, magnify this in cities that have 20, 30 million inhabitants or 20,000 inhabitants per square kilometer, you can imagine the complexity, the density, the traffic that you create, the uh, pollution you are generating, the noise you are generating. So there are many challenges. So we run an experiment. This is one of the, of the, of the dissertations of one of our PhD students that run an experiment in, the, in one of the cities in Guadalajara. You know where the mariachi is coming from? Do you remember these guys? You remember tequila? Yes? <laughs> yeah, some of you have a different face when I said tequila. <laughs> brings, brings memories. Uh, but in this city, we actually did some experiments like that. And we, we, we not only achieved better performance during the delivery operation, but we actually also reduced, for particular companies, an estimation of uh, 1,000 tons of CO2 per year. Right? And this is just an illustration. We have a lot of information on this. Now, this is one research streamline, helping CPGs, you know, to actually help this market. Now, when I was saying these 50 million nanostores, I remember a few years ago, I got access to different databases from different uh, CPGs. And the funny part is that it's true, nanostores are actually the largest market. But it's also true that 10% uh, of them in the database, database 10% disappears per month. 10%. Right. Now, almost 11% appears per month. So actually, the market is growing, but it's a different configuration. Now, every time you have these fluctuations, 
what's happening is if you're Coca-Cola and you're delivering to this market, what's going to happen is that every month you're going to have to readjust all your routing. It could be that the location of the distribution centers to deliver are actually wrong. Right? Maybe with the new dynamic in the following months, it was not the optimal because you were using the center of gravity to design this network. It might be also that you need to send more people to get the orders, and then you need to establish better relationships to keep this going. So there is a huge cost. And in the best case scenario, we estimate this to be $50 million for a company like Coca-Cola losing every year just because of the fluctuations of the diamond stores. So now everybody's looking at this and say, OK, so let's try to help them survive. If I can focus on 10, 20 percent of these nanostores, maybe I can actually do something better. So we started looking at the nanostores. This is a picture of me. By the way, not the best picture. <laughs> but uh, but I'm, two, I'm two meters high. I'm 6'6", six, six, so I'm actually quite tall. Yet, you know, I don't fit there. I have my fancy glasses. Have you seen these Ray-Ban stories? I'm not promoting anything, but I really like them. <laughs> so I'm actually recording how the operation looks like, so in case you, you can see it, right? And this is, this is the size, this is the assortment mm -hmm. of the vast majority of the firms that we have in the, in the world, and not just in Mexico, right? Now, the question here is, is there anything we can do so that we can increase the level of sophistication? Because when we discuss uh, composition of employment, uh, uh, the quality of life, when we discuss uh, good conditions for the job, this seems not be applicable here. At least it's more challenging. Like these guys are making a living, right? They don't have anything. They are not formal. They're not paying taxes. Let me just open my house, offer people to go and, you know, maybe they want to go to the restroom, so I will charge for that. I will sell cigarettes one by one. But this is the, 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 the way that people make a living in, this, in these regions, right? This, by the way, retail represents the largest economic center in the world, in the world, in, in Latin America, I'm sorry. Now, uh, in order to help them improve these practices, we've done a lot of uh, exploration, but I wanted to show some of the things that we are studying now. We feel very excited about it, because it turns out that every time that we discuss adoption of technology, uh, they don't want that because they know they're gonna be, uh, you're, you're gonna be able to track down the operations. And then maybe one day, you know, the tax office will come and will charge me, because now they know how much I'm moving. Now, all the things are, it's too complicated. We actually observed that out of 4,000 that we surveyed last year in Mexico, 4,000, 25% are actually uh, having a POS, point of sale system. They have a system that will allow them to make decisions. But actually, less than 40% are actually using it to make replenishment decisions. So if you have the system, it's very little. But even if you have it, you are not using it. Say so why? We argue that this has to do with the literacy of the technology. They don't really understand these dashboards. <coughs> you use a dashboard, you have a, some charts, it's like, okay, so what do I do with this? So what we started doing is use generative AI. We built, a, a, based on ChatGPT, a, another context to provide recommendations together with the dashboard. And in our experiment that we tested already in the lab, shows 10% of increase, not just in the adoption of the technology, but actually in the increase of sales. So we are showing that they actually tend to use it more, and they actually are asking more questions that make sense now with the, with the technology. Now, this technology seems a little bit sophisticated, but when you see how easy it is for them to use it, that actually changes entirely the game. Now, if, if you can envision how this technology may help interact, not just internally, but also with potential customers or suppliers, that actually means also the, the future. So now I have one last example. Uh, this example it comes from the research we've been doing on sustainability, and I was discussing this with Ben, which is one of uh, the next speakers for the next panel, um, which is the idea of uh, now trying to transition to the examples of sustainability. So as I said, I was not trying to build 20 slides and give a lecture on this, but I wanted to show what would be the power of transparency if we are able to connect the dots by quantifying particular environmental sustainability in a supply chain and communicate this effectively to consumers so that we can involve consumers or customers as part of our sustainability strategy. So as you know, some of the efforts have shown that, uh, for instance, the uh, fast shipping option. This is started in 2019, the real fast shipping, because fast shipping, for those that were before, we know it was two days, right? Two days was awesome already. But then later one day, Amazon said, oh, fast is same day delivery. Less than a month, Walmart.com launch it, then Target in a month, and then everywhere in the world. If you want to be in the e-commerce, you better be fast. Now, what we argue is that by having fast shipping, obviously, you have less time for planning. If you have less time for planning, that means you're going to be sending multiple trucks to the same neighborhood to deliver because you need to deliver multiple times instead of just sending one or two eyes every week. That's obvious because we, it happens here. Right? We, receive, we see these guys coming two, three times a day. 
Now, the question is, is there any way in which we can incentivize consumers to wait if we provide certain environmental information? So we test it. We say, well, what if I give you some money? 50% of those that we, we surveyed, around 1,000. Uh, this is in Mexico. We, we collaborated with a Mexican retailer called Copel. They sponsored this research. They said, well, what if I give you money? 50% said, uh, 70, I'm sorry, 70% said, I will be willing to wait. But there was 29, 30% that said, I don't want to wait. So even for those that said, I don't want to wait, we went again and asked, what if I tell you that every day that you wait, you are actually saving 30 trees, or stop killing 30 trees, because this is the amount of trees that I need to trap the amount of CO2 that is released to the atmosphere due to the, all the energy that I require now to save you in a fast shipping. So we tested trees, we tested uh, 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 kilograms of CO2, we tested other ones. And what we observe is that definitely matters the way that we display information. And what I wanted to show is one of the, this is the actual experiment. We run a survey with 1,000. This is the actual experiment we did in two cities, Monterey and Mexico City. And this is a mock-up in how it shows. Once you select your option, which in this case for a couple was today shipping, then you get the option to say, well, if you are willing to go for the green delivery, this is the amount of information. This is the, this is the, the savings we are going to get. Now, we tested this at the moment of the purchase. And we didn't get 70%, but we got 52% of people that actually changed their mind. Mm. This, is, this is not like they say and they don't do. No, they did. And that actually opens up a lot the, the, the world for options. Now, in order for this to happen, I remember when I presented this to Nike, and I hope also New Balances was excited. <laughs> they actually said, uh, oh, I love it. I want to show this to my consumers. Well, in order to do that, you need to first measure your carbon footprint, mm -hmm. which in turn implies you need to really know where is everything coming from. That's already a challenge. Second, once you measure it, you need to allocate this to a specific shipment so that you know how a shipment is actually contributing to this. Then second, what if I give you more days? Can you tell me how would you reallocate your system so that you will, in fact, deliver and save more? So after having all of this, you will be able to actually quantify and then communicate to the customers. And the biggest challenge is now to put together the guys from logistics and supply chain with the guys from commercial. As you know, they hate each other. Right? <laughs> this is the, the tension that exists. These guys always complain. They never deliver on time. These guys say they sell everything that we don't have. Because this is very hard, we don't see this really happening. But we see some efforts. At least now Amazon has a leaf saying, oh, this is a carbon free or something, but they don't say carbon, they say green delivery, but they don't say how much, right? Or they say fewer boxes. It requires more time, but we believe by doing this, the savings we observe, when we implemented this pilot for one month in the company, the savings in CO2 emissions, in fuel consumption, are not in the order of 5% or 10%. It was 39%, 39%, right? And this is really, really significant. But anyway, I already illustrated a lot. If you want to know more about it, uh, uh, this is my information, but thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you for two. Uh, I guess you want to have something nicer than uh, my logo. Thank you for two great presentations. So I wanted to ask, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Chris, a, a more direct question. Um, uh, sorry, uh, no, no slides. Um, so, you know, kind of the first part uh, of uh, building a sustainable uh, uh, supply chain is to you know, find and match with the right buyers. But the second part uh, is to kind of build relationships with those buyers uh, mm -hmm. in order to uh, uh, you know, achieve some of these goals of, of poverty reduction, of economic development, as well as of sustainability. So can you tell us a little bit how kind of large firms like New Balance uh, um, go about bringing positive change uh, in their supply chains and what the challenges are? And uh, also maybe a little bit about uh, hopeful things for the future, given kind of new technologies, new techniques, new information, uh, uh, and new strategies. Yeah, of course. Um, and I apologize. I don't have any fancy presentations today. <laughs> those are both very, very well done. Um, you know, I just kind of a little bit of a reflection in regards to what we've heard today and, and I think is well known is that as, you know, New Balance is a privately owned company, um, just first and foremost. And so, you know, as a privately owned company, public company, whatever your company is, like historically, you know, you have to change to compete, right? You have to change, you have to become better, you have to innovate, you have to invest. Um, you know, I've been with New Balance for many, many years, and you know, looking back on you know, the years that I've been with the organization, if if 
New Balance had made changes that it that it had at the time, we still you know we wouldn't be in a position where we're where we own five manufacturing facilities in the United States and one in the UK, because um, there's many brands that still exist but aren't able to kind of make that claim. So change is a necessary requirement for staying fresh and doing business. <clears throat> but when I think about building sustainable partnerships with vendors and suppliers, that's the one area that New Balance, I would say, really prides ourselves in, in not rapidly changing. So as a brand, you know, we really pride ourselves on kind of our core values and, you know, kind of a slogan within New Balance is 1NB. So 1NB meaning like within New Balance, there's this really sense of family, community, um, and, you know, that kind of resonates, you know, we try to have that resonate to the, not only to our employees, the customers, the retailers, the athletes we sponsor, and that then transcends itself also to the supplier relationship. And so when we have suppliers that we work with and develop long-term partnerships with, we're able to not only invest, but then realize the long-term impacts that that long-term relationship can have. Um, you know, I'm well aware of, and probably many of you are as well, of other, other companies, other brands where it's just the bottom line, right? It's, we need to make, you know, cut 5%. We need to turn this profit. We're going to move this from this location to that location. And yes, you save your bottom dollar for that next year. But yet, long-term relationship, you're, that's costing you something. So for us, I think the key takeaway is, you know, short term, um, it might cost you more money. But in the long term, you're going to be able to build those strong relationships and what we've seen in, in being able to have those long partnering relationships uh, and investing in working with these suppliers um, in you know, building you know, worker retention programs, building worker engagement programs, um, working with factories on pace, you know, soon to be rise, you know, all these different components that uh, really help to engage workers and, and build uh, build the brand for the long term. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. So I guess a, a kind of follow-on question there is, you know, we've been talking today, uh, uh, I guess, throughout the sessions about the role of evaluation, of data, of evidence in kind of um, driving decisions within, within companies and uh, driving positive change. Maybe you can uh, share a little about, I guess, uh, that process within New Balance and how you think... Uh, Maybe we can be more effective at bringing about, uh, you know, faster improvements in the well-being of workers, or greater sustainability changes, or just greater employment growth in the developing world uh, through that toolkit, uh, and uh, uh, how we might be more effective uh, at achieving that goal. Um, well, there's a lot to unpack in that series <laughs> of questions. Um, I think. I guess what I'll talk about just in regards to kind of measuring improvement is, um, you know, for many years, you know, brands and, and New Balance alike have been focused on f just fundamental basic compliance. And we've done some programs over the years to kind of work with our suppliers in regards to, uh, you know, working beyond compliance and, and these types of programs. And so <clears throat> um, what we've recently within the last year really been focusing on is building supplier capacity beyond basic compliance but doing so doing that in a manner where we're driving incentive for the suppliers and really honing in on what's important for us as a brand um, and so kind of key I would say buckets of priorities for us are obviously around environmental sustainability. Um, these are the three that we've identified, environmental sustainability, management systems and programs, and um, worker, um, kind of worker engagement, worker empowerment programs. Kind of, so kind of those three buckets and each one of those we've identified kind of key priorities that 
as a as a as a brand we're um, focused on, and in turn working with our suppliers as part of our long-term relationship to incentivize them to, to focus in these areas. So I think the key takeaway is identifying what's important um, for you as, as an organization and then working with your suppliers to, 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 to kind of yield those results. Um, so a question, I guess, for all of you. Uh, so. Can you think of, I guess, any notable examples which have uh, kind of served as uh, an illustration to I industries as a whole uh, of companies who've kind of very effectively integrated sustainability uh, into their supply chains uh, and kind of proven effectiveness of doing that uh, and how that kind of served as a catalyst and maybe some examples you're particularly excited about uh, 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 serving that role and obviously any, any of New Balance or others you are aware of? Well, maybe I can provide one. There is, there is a Colombian uh, CPG manufacturer uh, whose name is uh, Grupo Nutresa. They are hi highly integrated. They actually uh, understanding very well what uh, Chris was saying, how to develop the suppliers and growers in such a way that they can integrate all of these, let's say, uh, produce items into the manufacturing process. And something that they have been able to do is like to um, integrate uh, proper certifications into the suppliers in such a way that they, what they are going to be producing is going to be like meeting the requirements that the company needs to provide like high quality, high nutrition food for the Colombian people. Uh, something else that they are doing, and this is amazing, is like they are developing the shopkeepers, the, the owners of the nano stores, in such a way that they are actually aiming to develop also the community side and making sure that the impact of their own vehicles that now they are migrating into electric vehicles in the areas that is possible, um, they are creating this impact. But probably the one that I like the most is the fact that they are really um, trying to promote the social component in what they are doing. They do care about like um, vulnerable population segments by bringing more products into those areas, even at, at more affordable prices with the help of uh, community managers in, that, in those areas. So um, if you think about it carefully, so uh, the combination of all of these warranties that the waste is gonna be low, that you're gonna make sure that you have like a proper visibility uh, at least to the shopkeeper that is very close to the community. And on the other hand, if they just start migrating into other type of vehicles, this could allow them also to reduce like the CO2 <coughs> emissions. The, they are now thinking about developing like a methane capture uh, strategies also to reduce the impact that they have in the, in the agricultural practices too. So for me, this is a perfect example of a potential circular supply chain. Yeah, no, I, I, I can think of uh, multiple examples, although I can probably not say one particular comprehensive, right, that will have all the complete map in the supply chain of all the different tiers of suppliers and then customers. I haven't seen that yet, but if that exists and if you've seen it, let me know, please, so that we go and see it. Uh, but so far I've seen some uh, efforts then trying to include this, some strategies, and trying to, to figure, figure out the way in which this can actually be uh, op operationalized and, and also sustainable, right? Like, like for instance, it, when we discuss about sustainability, we know that we are discussing of a concept that relates to always look into the future, right? So what we were considering as sustainable 10 years ago or 20 years ago, things have changed. Now the, the, the priorities and other things are becoming more potentially scarce and, uh, and are causing other type of effects. So those that are considered sustainable supply chains by, by definition are, are those that are very good at monitoring what is currently happening and what also is the risk for the future, right? So it's an exercise of a trajectory. This is at least how, how I like to see it. Now, some examples that I've seen that are very, very interesting. Uh, I remember, for instance, the cases of, um, uh, this, is a, 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 this is UNICEF, right? Some of our, our, our alums was working on a UNICEF with a project in, in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to develop a network that will do distribution, you know, for kids in Zimbabwe. But the idea was, can we build that network considering not just uh, effectively deliver you know, on time and with minimization of cost, but something that will also account for, one, the carbon emissions associated with the operation, and two, that we will consider buying from local suppliers in the region. Mm -hmm. 
right? And that will be the social indicator, so that we will also see some employability uh, indicator. And actually, the project built into something very interesting. It was done by a couple of uh, master's students from here in collaboration with some people from UNICEF. But that actually is the type of, at least to my mind, the type of engagements that, um, that will definitely create an impact and, 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 and will serve as an example for other organizations. Now, this is, this is one example in this, in this domain. But if we look at uh, top companies, we recently uh, conducted uh, uh, another project with Dell Technologies. And they'll, as many other top companies, they have all the United Nations sustainability goals in their, in, their, in their vision. They say, well, this is what we are envisioning for the future. And they have different indicators to work. Now, the question is, as an organization, should you have a sustainability department that is external to all the operations, more like a continuous improvement that works with everyone but with no one? Or, or you have something that is embedded into the indicators of, of, of everybody that is making decisions? What I've seen consistently is the, is the former. Uh, everybody has these sustainability departments, but they struggle because they need to get data from everybody. They need to get everybody involved. They seem not to be the essence of what we are doing here for business. Right? But in that exercise, what uh, we've seen is it helps at least to connect different goals. So we studied, for instance, one of the indicators was to use more recycled material for the packaging. Mm -hmm. so they, let's use more because if we use more, as you know, this is part of one of the three R's in sustainability. Uh, it matters if we recycle, then we are going to make better use. We are reducing the carbon footprint of the material. Now, what's the challenge? It turns out that every time they will increase the, the use of this material, they change the design of the, of the box as well as the weight, which in turn affected the, 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 the transportation activity. So, so this reduction will increase carbon emissions in the overall operation. Right? And, and it was like, oh, what's going on? So we studied this, and they said, well, can you build a model to study all the 15? I said, well, we probably need five uh, PhD dissertations, right? Uh, but, but the reality is that th why, why this, is, uh, this is happening? Because we are building strategies also in silence, because we are still figuring out what's the best way to organize all this information, because there is still not, not so much communication, which is normal. I believe by the stage that we are, it's, it's good that there, there are these attempts, and I believe Dell is doing awesome in experimenting at this point and investing on research on that. But, um, but, but yeah, for me, for me the, the interesting part is uh, how, we, how can companies transition for both having a department that is also external to the operations, but also having indicators in the operations that they can use to track how all the departments are actually contributing to their goals. If at this point you know, there, is a, there, there are the demand planning uh, uh, departments, right? So you have an area that does the forecasting. How, how, how does forecasting affect your sustainability strategy? I can assure you that if you have a horrible forecast, you remember Esther already said it, Everything is hard if you try to predict about the future. She can predict the past, she said. Fine. So when you try to predict the future and you screw up by 45%, how many expedited deliveries do you think you're going to have? Mm -hmm. It's a lot of emissions. How much inventory are you going to have to have? Right? Like just think about all the, the different bullwhip effect that is going to happen in the supply chain because of just an, an error in the forecast. Do we know what is implication in inventory replenishment strategy? Do we know in the scheduling? So uh, there are some efforts. I've seen also other companies like uh, Kinaxis, for instance. They work in technology, and they are developing like the first tools to actually help organizations keep track of this. But, uh, but to be fair, I can give you some examples, as I'm doing, uh, David, but I'm, uh, I'm not so sure if I can give you one that is actually totally comprehensive, because I believe we are, we are giving the right steps into the right direction, yet there is still so much work to be done. Um, a lot, a lot of insights in, in your answer. Thank you so much for that. And, and just to wrap up, uh, Chris, do you have any any thoughts? I guess when we'll go over to some questions on, I guess, f for you in the, in the shoe industry or garments more generally, uh, you know, examples of, of, of kind of leadership which uh, other companies would do well to follow in terms of innovations people have made. Um, I think I would, um, I'm going to, go to a very kind of specific example. Um, and I'm, I'm going to just call upon a, a case study that we actually published just this past on our public on our website that's in regards to fair compensation. So I um, want to just give a call out to Jeff Seibertz, who's also in the audience from New Balance, who worked um, a lot of hours on this. But um, so we've got a fair compensation program, you know, where we're trying to elevate workers' wages within the supply chain. And this case study was on our factories in Vietnam where we focused in on eight key suppliers. Um, and these eight suppliers where it doesn't sound like 
that's like amongst our whole supply chain, doesn't seem very large, but that they represent nearly 50% of our global footwear production, okay? So uh, six out of those eight suppliers as part of our case study, we identified that they were meeting or exceeding global living wage coalition benchmarks for wages. Um, there were two that were, um, that were close but not, not meeting. So the differentiator between those two, um, and we heard a, uh, in, an, in another presentation this morning, the differentiator between those that were, that were exceeding global living wage versus those that weren't came down to um, worker retention. Um, so ba essentially what we, what we confirmed was that uh, workers uh, who stay with the organization longer develop more skills um, and thus in turn they stay with the organization longer and they have more upward more, more, more mobility to actually earn wages. And so what that proved to us, kind of again going back to our long-term relationship kind of uh, strategy and also the the programs that we have in place to support worker engagement and um, training and all the, the various programs that we have in place do have an impact in regards to worker wages. So um, yeah, so that's just kind of a very specific example that we've seen internally based on the work that we're doing. Great, thank you so much. So we have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, uh, does anyone have a... So very interesting, whatever the insight that you have given. Uh, my question is about the reverse logistics. You provide certain things to the nano store, maybe perishable, non-perishable. The perishable items has limited shelf life. If it is not sold within that period, then it has got to be disposed of. So what is the uh, thing that you are disposed of means either you can take it back and use whatever the way you want to use, or maybe, you know, what are the disposal methods, you know, whether you are interested in that one, or whether it is the responsibility of the nano store. Okay, well, maybe I can take that, uh, unless you want to take oh, no, 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 uh, the food waste. In terms, and, in terms of uh, that component, to go to the point, uh, is responsibility of the shopkeeper, right? Uh, at the moment, it's very difficult to, let's say, warranty that somebody else is going to take responsibility of that, you know? But something that we are trying to create is like a strategies to recover that food. We are working hard with the food banks in order to make sure that they are able, like, you know, like to recover not only this type of uh, food from big retailers, but also from these uh, millions of uh, small family-owned retailers, you know, uh, with the idea that... Um, uh, that somebody else can take advantage of it, you know, charities, etc. But something that we have found so far, just with the exploratory approach that we are using, is that it's not cost effective, unfortunately. And I know that the uh, food banks are non for profit organizations, but in terms of like what Jose actually was mentioning, it's like very expensive to do all of this recovery as well, all of these returns. So, something that we are currently doing is to uh, create a system at which the shopkeeper can you know, like donate that into, into the neighborhood in such a way that the uh, food banks are gonna coordinate that effort, you know? So um, uh, something else that we are doing also in order to cut like all the shelf life that is lost in the process of a store and inventory in some of the uh, big wholesalers, for instance, or the distributors is to create like a, a direct to nano store channel, right? Is, but the issue there is that um, we're going to be putting all the risk into the smallholder farmer and also into the, into the shopkeeper. So uh, this kind of subsidies that is pretty similar to the corporate supported agriculture, but instead of delivering to the uh, doorsteps, right, is delivering to the, to the nano store. And our idea there is that the shopkeeper is going to be able to provide like cross sales, you know, with uh, cooking oil that people will need to, you know, like uh, use to, to cook that food. But yes, to, to your point, there is plenty of opportunities there. Thank you for the question. Great, and we have time for one more question. Hi, um, 
interesting session uh just curious to know what you think about role kind of government regulation can play in this or you think it's better that it's organized privately and no government regulation there maybe yeah i guess <laughs> maybe let me let me kind of put that question to to chris in terms of you know there's one you know question which i certainly have thought a lot about which is a uh, you know in a perfect world uh, the governments of these countries would be implementing all of these regulations. They're not. And what role, I guess, do multinationals have in implementation, or should it not be the role of multinationals in implementation? Do you have any views on that? Uh, I mean, I would say that it's it, it's there's definitely there's definitely a role. Um, and you know, I don't think you know as a brand we could sit back and just not in, in, not engage with. The government, you know, organizations um, to help enact uh, changes in these areas, and so, um, yeah, there's there's definitely a role, and um, I think it's obviously many in many of these areas, it's uh, a steep challenge to be able to um, enact those changes, and uh, but there's definitely a role, and. Um, you know, I think that there's an opportunity for cross-brand collaboration and and you know partnerships with other you know NGOs and organizations to help you know collaborate on that. Um, so let me just very briefly wrap, wrap up. You know, I think we've had a fascinating discussion. We've, you know, it's very hard to discuss all <laughs> supply chain issues in, in 45 minutes, and we've been covering small firms and and, and big firms. Uh, but you know, one thing I think that. Uh, uh, you know, is common in both in both these cases is the ability for you know one set of actors to bring about uh, uh, change and impact is is just massively magnified through supply chains. Uh, you know, one firm that may have 200 employees may be indirectly employing uh, through first, second, third, fourth tier uh, uh, suppliers uh, many thousands of more. And so, you know, really, uh, 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 you know, progress here is difficult, but uh, the progress uh, uh, can be massively uh, amplify. Uh, the impact of an individual firm if it's able to do so. And I think there's a lot of excite, exciting op opportunities going forward, especially as the technologies of traceability, of tracking, and, and, and digitization improve and gives us much greater visibility into these things and allows some of these exciting projects mm -hmm. that we're working on uh, uh, at the uh, Transport and Logistics Center uh, to be possible, which just uh, simply wasn't the case 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and so I, I think we're at a juncture here uh, uh, with your generative AI responding to how many Coca-Cola uh, bottles to stock. Um, so um, thank you so much uh, to our panel, uh, and uh, hopefully we can continue the conversation uh, uh, during the rest uh, of the uh, sessions today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.